Hello, and welcome to Holistic Emails, Email and More, a Q&A with. I'm your host, Skip Federa, and today we will be talking about everybody's favorite topic, deliverability. But more specifically, we're going to be talking about what you need to do now to be ready for the holiday season. I did some research earlier. Black Friday is only 99 days away. As this is your show, we bring together the experts, but it's your yeah, questions sure. that drive the conversation. And we're doing this live. It's unscripted, it's unrehearsed, and it's always a lot of fun. So sit back, uh, get engaged, ask us some questions. In the meantime, none of this would be possible without our lovely sponsors. So our platinum sponsor this year is RPE Origin. RPE Origin's team of email experts has been obsessed with email marketing for nearly 20 years. From start strategy to creative to execution to data analysis, they help companies increase their email ROI through a cross-vertical data-centric approach. And our silver sponsor this year is Email Expert. Email Expert is an online community and organizer of both in-person and online events, hosting renowned conferences like the Deliverability Summit, the Deliverability. Festival of Email, and the MarTech Festival. Beyond events, Email Expert offers a comprehensive vendor directory, an industry blog, and opportunities for online tests and certifications for its members. Email Expert is committed to equipping you with the latest insights and tools to excel in your email marketing endeavors. I can't believe it, but this is actually our fifth season of uh, Email More. We've got a ton of content in our back catalog. So just go to www.listicemailmarketing.com and click on the events tab and check out all of our back content. It's really special. Okay, now, as I alluded to, we have put together a brilliant panel for you today. We've got Yudume Akut, a deliverability thought leader, Raymond Dykshorn from Serbal, Radek Kaczynski, CEO of Bouncer, and with me as always is best-selling author and award-winning thought leader, Kath Pei of Holistic Email Marketing. Now, our time always goes by way too quickly. So folks, get your questions into the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. And as a way to kick off, I want to tell you all, email marketers are special because email marketing is different. Email marketing has always been different. Back in the early days of email, if you paid for a billboard, your ad went up on the billboard that you had rented. If you paid for a direct mail campaign, every piece of post was sent out. And if you booked an ad on local radio, you were sure that ad would run in the slots that you had chosen. Unfortunately, that was not the case with email marketing. As a marketer, you would pay an ESP to send your email, but it may or may not get to the recipient. And that was largely out of your hands. You could influence things, but ultimately it came down to the relatively unsophisticated filtering algorithms of the email receivers. Email was different. We were the only channel and still are the only channel that doesn't really pay the owner of the space where we're advertising. And those owners, the email receivers, have bigger things to worry about than marketing emails getting delivered to the recipients who asked to receive them. Their challenges were huge. Back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, each receiver was dealing with hundreds of millions of inbound emails per day and estimates of 90% plus of those were spam. Email worked and spammers worked it better than anybody. So the spammers were great at getting around the receiver's filters, which forced the receivers to get better and make better filters. But email marketers, we were always playing catch up. Now, luckily things have changed for the better. Receivers have gotten much smarter and much better at developing their um, algorithms. There's still a lot of spam, but I think a lot of spammers have been distracted by other channels. But most importantly, all of this history forced email marketers to get better and be better. Our focus on segmentation, design, copywriting, all those things to drive engagement has made email marketers the best marketers in the world. But even the best in the world or being the best in the world does not mean that you would not benefit from some expert advice and a bit of coaching. And that's what we've put together for you today. Think of this as a coaching clinic to get you tip top and tidy in time for the holidays. So with that, I wanna bring in our esteemed panel. Hi everybody, how you doing? Great. Next. As a way to kick off, I would love to hear from each of you. I laid out a, a, at this point, the cats has heard me say this loads. I've been in email marketing since Yahoo and AOL were relevant. And I laid out what, what it was like then, right? The, the ancient history of deliverability. What's one key change in deliverability 
it, recent change in deliverability that marketers should be aware of as we head into that holiday season? Ludeman, let's start with you. Thank you, Skip. I thought you were going to go ladies first, but sure. Um, one thing that I can say is that every little piece of an email household is important. Think of the analogy like your house, you have the door, the fridge, the kitchen, the bathroom, the bedrooms. Um, so every piece of your house is important. And then you flip that over to email, every piece is important, whether it's a domain, whether it's an IP, whether it's the content, what is the content structure? It matches the HTML balancing, but also putting yourself in the shoe of an end user. For example, I wouldn't like to receive a campaign to buy a microwave every day. I don't need a microwave every day. So put yourself in the shoes of an ISP. And their end, they would say, if that's too aggressive, then there's a chance that it's too spammy in their eyes. One thought from you? Yeah, I, I agree. It starts with your house and, and I sometimes compare sending email with a car. You need to take care of, of your car before you go on holidays. We get the holiday seasons, so that's good. And basically don't turn Black Friday into Block Friday because then you will have a horrible weekend. That's not what you want. But the changes, I think there's better understanding of a lot of the regulations that happened in, in Europe over the last few years. and we see more understanding, okay, we need to comply with that. And we also see a lot of understanding on the ESP side where they do start to know that clicks and opens are not always what they seem to be. And that's one of the bigger changes that I saw that like with Apple MPP and a lot of the other security vendors opening your emails to just see if it's not malicious, that will impact deliverability, at least the rates a lot. I would say check the conversion rates more than the open rates. That's a very good point. That's an interesting view though. Also that I, I, th I think I want to get back to later is I was on a call with a, a bunch of email marketers who are complaining about MPP. I don't think that whole approach of we're just, we're opening the email to see if it's malicious before the consumer opens it. That's an interesting take that I don't think a lot of email marketers have, have thought about. So we definitely want to get back to that. Radek, what's your, what's your one thought? Yeah, I, th I think that there have been a couple of buzz kind of buzzwords recently, like Yahoo Go and yeah, Apple MPP. However, those like, those are not like revolutionary changes. It's, it, it, it's more of like enforcement of the things of best practices that have been there for decades. However, it's, it's interesting this, to see like the, that things start to come together and and that if it comes to approach to to email marketing like we're getting back to basics like respect uh to our audience like taking care of our own reputation but also taking care of someone else's resources like not abusing someone else's resources looking at the things holistically from end-to-end -end aspects and from looking at the whole like customer journey or you know let's say yeah user journey all the inter inter interactions with us so it's pretty interesting me to see how those things come together and at the same time see how another aspects like the ai kind of yeah expansion lately may be influencing also the anti-spam filters there's a ton of ai generated content right now flying over that is not being captured as spam and, uh, and i'm sure that the big big guys and i guess our experts may confirm or that are working the, the biggest the esps are working right now to identify the ai generated content just to reduce the noise in the channel because the, the channel starts to begin again noisy just when a lot of uh, stuff if it comes to anti-spam filters came into place so it's interesting to see those evolutions small evolutions over the last few years that and it's not like gradual as i would say like with steps or the staircase uh, right. evolutions sure it's quantum changes every regular period i i like the notion of getting that you had about getting back to basics and respect I used to talk about how people go into work and they put on their marketer hat and they forget that outside of work, they're a consumer too. And the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated. So Kath, coming at this from more of a marketing strategic perspective, what do you think 
what's your one thought about what people need to be concentrating on when it comes to deliverability uh, from that angle? The thing is, I've been a deliverability consultant slash expert since early to 2000, so 2004, all the rest of it, and before. And back then, we were just talking about like spam words, right? And that was, and, and I can remember painstakingly going through one of my clients who's trying to sell property in front in, in Spain, and that apparently was very spammy. And so I'm working for hours trying to get rid of these words and substitute them for other words and everything like that. Whereas now, like for me, getting the authentication literally revolutionized deliverability. It revolutionized email marketing. And we've not stopped. We're still doing it. So even DMARC recently came in as being a like a mandated one, right? As opposed to historically it was in there with it's a nice to have, but hey, but now they've said you need to have it. That's I don't Raymond pro probably speak to this better than me and, and you may as well. There could be more down down the track. And if there are, embrace them, the existing ones, embrace them because they're there to make your job as a legitimate marketer easier. Bringing in that question that you just asked me, Skip, from a strategic perspective, that then means that marketers can spend less time because they've got all the infrastructure, all the authentication, everything all lined up. And now we're talking about strategy. Now we're talking about sending the right message to the right person at the right frequency and using that persuasion and psychology that we tend to talk a lot about it, holistic and everything. And then you, you've got a great program happening and it's getting delivered into inboxes. We work with our clients all the time on doing just this. We've just got a, a new client within eight weeks. We got them from zero Gmail to 100% Gmail deliverability by doing Thing. So that strategic element is super, super important, and we can't forget about it. So we're 99 days out from Black Friday, which, frankly, I wish I hadn't looked that up because I was like, are you kidding? The year is like over. Where did the year go? <laughs> I still think it's 2023 sometimes. <clears throat> but, Kath, to your last point about turning things around, we're not going to we're not going to be able to fail somebody else. If, if, if somebody's really having huge deliverability problems, reach out to anybody on the panel. I'm sure they'd be willing to, to, to send you over a very large contract, sort that out for you before Christmas. But let's say I'm in a situation where I'm not sure. I don't know how my deliverability is. Maybe I don't monitor it as closely as I should. Raymond, let's start with you. What warning sign that I should look out for? I would say before you do Black Friday, so uh, to have the, the, the mindset a bit like that I'm thinking on, we see a lot of marketeers that say, okay, Black Friday, that's basically heading towards the big sales for us. And they go into their closet and dust off all those lists that they want to reach out and have not been emailing to for quite a while. Yeah. And especially for events like that, don't do it if you want to engage with those clients do that like during the year but if you dust off the list and and start to do that's a recipe for failure i think if you want to like beef up your deliverability that's something you should not do i think but we see it happening and we get all the esps that are basically trying to reach out for their clients if they're running shared tracker domains and things like that it's black friday can you not help us and yeah it's black friday but don't do stupid things. It, it doesn't really make sense for those kind of events to send to people that you usually should not send to. It's all about consent. It's all about brand engagement. And sometimes more is less. So if you are, if, if you're doing something like that would be my advice, don't do things that you are not doing the whole year already. And some of your clients want to have that focus on Black Friday but it should be a positive vibe that, that they are getting after the event, right? Raymond? I think we should... Uh, go ahead. Go got ahead, a right. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skip mentioned we, we still have 99 days. Is it, Do you think it's about high time or is it 
already too late to, let's say, re-engage some of your audience during the summertime before before the yeah the high season, like the Cyber Week and Black Friday. Are we already done, or can we still no. like do some stuff? No, and I think Kat can uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, uh... A lot more than I do. I only see the things arriving that should not. But <laughs> I think do something before the 60-day limit, basically. The last uh, 30 days you have, basically, to engage even more with them. But uh, don't start mm. to, bl to blast off the email campaigns yeah. in the last week or two, because that's what we see a lot. Absolutely. The bottom line is if you're going to just, just... Okay, ISPs don't like spikes. So if you just go, okay, this is our normal scent, and then suddenly we send to everybody and we do this huge big spike, okay, you're going to be giving me a call and saying, help me, please, because you're, everything's going to be really bad for you. You're, not, you're going to have a huge drop in revenue and all the rest of it. So don't do that. The main thing is that depending on the size of your list is going to decree how soon you need to start ramping up. And that's what you need to do is ramp up. And then once you ramp up, you need to ramp down as well because you want to avoid that spike. But the thing that I work with a lot of my clients to do is to have automated lapsing, lapsed and wing back programs happening throughout the year so that these people, one, those programs clean out any, if they've not been opening, clicking or buying from you, then there's a good chance or there is a chance that that email address is no longer being used. So you, you could have a bounce problem. And yeah. if you send a lot all at the same time, you'll have a massive bounce problem. And that then can also cause you big problems. If you do it through automation 60 days after last purchase and they've not purchased since, then they get an automated email. And it could be a series of five emails. And you just maybe you win them back and you get money for, for it, fantastic. Maybe you just get them open, you cleanse the database, and then they're not going to be in total shock when you actually send them a Black Friday campaign. So it, it wins on so many accounts. It has that, like what Raymond was saying, it means that you are contacting them throughout the year, albeit because they're not recent openers and recent transactors and everything, probably not as frequently as you would do those that are frequent openers and transactors because you do need to respect that as well. So it's really, it, this is where it comes down to what I was saying to you. It's incredibly strategic. Mm -hmm. So not just... And, and also be aware that the opens that you are doing might not be the actual user. So sometimes we have conversations with ESPs and they say, how can all of these end up in your spam traps? Because it's all engaging users. And then when you have the discussion, like what is an engaging user? Is that like a robot that clicked the link or is it Apple MPP that did something? Is it the security vendor? If you do not filter out the bot clicks in a proper way, it is really hard to basically say to us that these are engaging people mm -hmm. because from our point of view, you didn't do your homework. And I must say the homework is getting harder and harder. We see some of the bot farms using residential IPs. We did that and we did a presentation in, in Germany about that on the CSA summit, but it is really hard to determine that. But we also see some ESPs who basically don't do anything. They say, we saw a bot click. We don't care. It was a click. We recorded it and we marked it as active. But if, if like Apple MPP is doing a large part of the market email wise, you should take into account that these clicks, you should have a closer look. Are these really the users clicking? Do you see a lot of the clicks like right after sending? Or you can assume that like each and everyone is exactly waiting for your email at 3 a.m. But usually mm -hmm. when you get a lot of clicks right after sending, that's a good indication that it is not the actual users, but you're being bot farmed or clicked by security vendors. Take that into account, look at your log files, check who is doing the clicks. Sometimes they put a referrer in there that you could recognize. But yeah, the discussion, what is an active user is becoming harder and harder from that aspect. Mm -hmm. But I guess this is like a probably homework for the 
for the marketing automation platforms or marketing yes. suites to actually be able to identify those bot clicks, right? So that the marketer doesn't have to already has the full visibility of who, who's engaging and who's not. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but it, yeah, we still see some gap to be done by the by those folks, or some of the providers. So yeah, so you get that. you get into a, a bit of a challenge from a marketer perspective in the sense that a lot of email marketers are compensated based on the level of engagement of their list. Um, hopefully not so much anymore the size of the list, but the level of engagement of the list. And if all of a sudden the ESP does start doing its homework and says, oh, no, your click-through rate is, you know, 40% of your clicks are bots. So your click-through rate isn't, it's half of what we told you it was. All of a sudden they're like, then they're panicking and they have to explain it internally. So it's one of those things where, you know, as a marketer, you want to make sure that the ESP you're using is filtering all that stuff out from the beginning so that you don't have some huge explanation to your boss or bosses later to say, I know I've been telling you that we've had an 80% click through rate, but really a lot of those were bots and they don't really count. Yeah, that's why I say conversion rate is uh, more important. Even if you see the, the click rates going up and down, but your conversion rate is pretty steady, you're doing a good job. Absolutely. Any additional thoughts on this part of the discussion? I, um, the question was, was originally, what kind of warning signs should we be looking out for? And I'm not sure we actually got, we've talked to that yet. Add to what's been discussed already. There are two pieces to it. For example, if we have maybe your average ESP, they have certain red flag gray zone thresholds, let's say 40 miles over speed limit. Let's say six bounces an hour, or four hard, hard bounces an hour, three soft bounces, whatever indicator the ESP or marketing platform may have. That's an indicator where I would say something is wrong or something could be wrong. There's a piece of it, like Raymond discussed, that is tricky. You look at conversions to determine if it's real or negative traffic. There's also the pieces where you could have a very great marketing program with maybe 99.9% .9 deliverability. And I've seen folks that are not comfortable with that and will say, what can I do to be better? And I say, it goes back to the car analogy or the house analogy, put yourselves in the shoes of the users. Also, like I think was, has been said before, more on the deliverability side, quality is not, um, quality and quantity are two different things. So to your point about monetizing marketing, Yes, that part is great, but I would rather have a better deliverability quality versus quantifying, oh my goodness, we're making a billion bucks, a billion euros. There's a sweet spot in between, depending on the program, the brand, the frequency, stuff like that. Also going to the, it's almost holiday season scenario perspective, like it's been, like it's been discussed already. We shouldn't have to wait till late summer, early fall, if you're in the U.S to say, oh, it's time to cook that list up out of the basement and start blasting again. The microwave analogy still comes to play where I would say, it's been a year. I know they bought a microwave. They have 20 kids, so they use a microwave more. Probably they need a couple of campaigns to see if they still quote unquote care. One or two campaigns, if they don't, I would drop them into the 10 fewer marketing campaigns bucket scenario if they're like, 20 kids and they, I've seen they've bought two microwaves in 2024, I will go, hmm, that's a pretty good candidate to think about with the holiday season coming up. There's a, it's not a black or white, but it's depending on the brand, the product, the scenario, the quality, those signals will help determine what to do. Um, it is difficult, honestly, to talk to higher leadership, be it at a CEO level, CMO, where, you know, the dollars and the euros count. Yes, but there's also the part from Raymond's perspective where you can blast all you want. And his point is just, I see negative traffic. He's not like he's sitting with a switch or a Santa one blocking people. <laughs> no, it, it's just the system does its job. So it sees negative traffic. It's going to scream, send the warning signal. Something causes problems. It's not just magical. So there is that 0.01% false positive here and there, but chances are it's pretty slim most times. So, yeah. I think the, the other piece of this for me, this, so there, there are a couple of things. 
So I started it. So first off, I, I now have this image of Raymond sitting in like a bunker with this big lever. And it's block, block. We got to get a meme uh, created of that at some point. But the other thing I was thinking about is, oh, Black, Black Friday is coming. I'm going to start hitting my list. That it feels to me like starting to just shoot notes to everybody on Facebook and Instagram and in, in my WhatsApp right before my birthday, hoping to get a couple of extra presents. It just seems really pathetic. Um, <laughs> yep. But, yep. <laughs> but then the third thing is Black Friday in America at least makes sense. It is the Friday after Thanksgiving. Black yeah. Friday in Europe or in the UK, all, for all of Europe, but it, it's definitely taken hold in the UK, is just a random Friday in November. It makes no sense at all. At least you're, if, if you send it to an American audience, it's not the right way to do it, but at least from a consumer standpoint, okay, it's Black Friday, that's why they're doing it. You do it in the UK and it's just, I was gonna say pathetic again, but that might be too harsh. Yes, Kat. <laughs> it's around the time of my birthday, so that's why we have it in the UK. I'm so sorry, I forgot that. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will no longer be doing Black Friday. It is Cafe's birthday. <laughs> Just like the king, she celebrates with a big parade. Uh, come down to London and we'll have a party. Okay. And there's more of those events that basically turned into commercial uh, sales days, right? Valentine's days. Uh, you have a lot of those. And in Europe, they used to be less intense, but they picked up pretty well. Kath, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this question to you first. I want everybody to weigh in, but this is right in, in your wheelhouse. This is a, a question from Frank Ricks, CEO of Dialogue One. And it says, I think re-engagement campaigns are a waste of time until you've done your homework. And okay, actually, I'm going to re read that slightly differently. He thinks <laughs> that re-engagement campaigns are a waste of time if you haven't done your homework and still send irrelevant, boring emails to try to re-engage people. He wants to know what we think. It's an interesting one. I always... I always ask people, if you're just going to send the same thing, why won't they disengage again? Kath, what are your thoughts on that one? Absolutely. Totally agree with Frank. Yeah. So what you need to do in that case is, yes, be very strategic, do your research, understand about this audience, um, and then come up with a couple of things. One, uh, a novel approach. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to very much work with um, personalities. So there's the four main personalities, um, methodical, competitive, spontaneous, and humanistic. And we try to get their attention that way. And when I'm talking about reactivation, I'm talking about reactivation, not in re-engagement, okay? So re-engagement, again, you can probably use the same tactics, but uh, I'm less pro re-engagement. I'm more pro reactivation, which means we want them to buy. So offers are very important as well. Just how you present it and how you target the audience is really key. So yes, if you're going to send them the same old, then there is with maybe 10% offer or something like that. It's not going to get their attention. They really need, and, and again, we break them into lapsing, lapsed, and then a win back. So essentially these lapsing haven't yet fully lapsed. And they're the easiest to bring back and so on. It works down. And you want to have different offers. You want to speak to them differently and all the rest of it. So, again, we've gone back to the very strategic, but great question, Frank. And don't just go, oh, let's go and create. And we'll just do a, a, a different version, a slightly different version of our welcome program or something like that. No, it's, it's completely different. What about chucking an offer at it? Yeah, offers offers work, absolutely. And in some cases, depending on the product, the business, all the rest of it, the audience, that's the only way you're going to win them back. Other ones can be, and again, that's for reactivation. For reengagement, you don't necessarily need to have that. You just need a, a bit of a, a different approach, different, different copy, different targeting or personalization. But yeah, an offer to sweeten the deal, definitely. But again, if you're a brand who doesn't do offers, you have to really think outside the box as to what you can do to, to bring them back. And Udemy, you were talking a minute ago about a very similar approach to what Kat's talking about, doing your research, understanding 
what the product is the person bought, uh, what it is you sell, what the likelihood is that they might need a repeat purchase or potentially an add-on purchase. I guess the question, the unasked question in that, in, in Frank's question is, to what level of granularity should we be going to in order to re-engage people? Like, how specific should we be getting? The more specific you can be, the better. So any data points or KPIs that you have at your mercy works in terms of the location, like you brought up the point about Black Friday in the UK, the US. I've seen some brands also look as far as user engagement, which is key from a deliverability perspective on how ISPs and block lists look at determining what to do with mail flow, be it suspicious, legit, over legit, or wacky looking. Those things help in determining how far down the rabbit hole you can look to say, um, it's a waste of time. It's useful. For example, I used to fly one airline a lot. I switched to a different airline last fall in the U.S. Every now and then I'll poke at the previous airlines app, but I noticed that the marketing stuff I got from the airline reduced. So they're looking at a data point of app usage, for example. So if a brand has an app. I said, okay, they thought about that. Interesting. So I didn't mark them as spam, but I would look, read, delete. But they can probably tell I'm still looking, spending 10 seconds on an email, opening the app every, I don't know, two, three months. So stuff like that. So any data point you have helps, but also geolocation does play a point. For example, I'm sure Cat doesn't want to receive a US based Black Friday, Cyber Monday campaign on her birthday. You probably might could have spent. And what if it came from, I don't know, um, Niagara Falls? If she's never been here, there you go. That's spam. Some people hit the spam button. Some people go the extra mile and send it to one of the block lists or ISPs and complain that you may want to check this brand because it's not to put them in the doghouse, but people do also make honest mistakes. Any data point you have works. It may look like a lot of work, but Automation helps, tools help, and so on and so forth. And you may you touch on an interesting point there. Um, and, and Raymond, in the discussions that people have with you, if if they've got good solid evidence that this group of consumers is engaging on the app, but isn't engaging on the email, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming you're going to say then hit them up on the app and don't hit them up on email. Is that yeah, accurate? And it also makes you wonder if the emails and that's something i keep advocating for have been verified at all so if the app works keep using that i i would say you have a nice channel to reach them but don't confuse like an email stream that you did not verify that can be completely different and to make a, a point that usually people do understand sometimes they don't is that if you have a zero percent bounce rate that does not tell you anything about spam traps. So spam traps, to make a blunt statement, they accept everything. So you can send 500,000 emails to a spam trap system. The bounce rate is zero. So you did a great job, but actually not really. And Radek, I think you see that also when doing the validations. Yeah, there is a, there's a lot of email domains that if you look at them, and you look at your own email list, you're like, really, you could not figure out that these 5,000 variants of Hotmail that are not Hotmail, that they should not belong in your list. Yeah, that always puzzles me a little bit. Yeah, that's that, and that brings us to another kind of interesting point. And I touched on it earlier, and I hope that it's no longer the case that email marketers are measured on list size. But obviously, before you send even the first email, you want to you want to keep the garbage out, and if for some reason you get garbage in through some other source, uh, you want to be able to get it out of your system. I guess the the question to you is, what are your recommendations to clients on proactively? I don't want to use the word scrub. I'll say clean or tidy, or let's do list maintenance. Proactive list maintenance. Let's call it that. I like that. Yeah. So it's it all depends the strategies if it comes to like list hygiene or maintenance of your audience list depends of actually how does your marketing funnels look like. And if there are 
areas or holes that actually like a little bit more risky data could come in. So let's say in the ideal world scenario, every single email that is on your list has been like double opt-in, verified, maybe at the moment of capture, whether it was online or over the phone or over the counter, there have been some verification from the, yeah, if actually the, the person is interested in what you've got to offer, that's one thing. And let's say you are like keeping continuous communication, especially with the engaged part of the audience. And from time to time, you do the win backs for the unengaged. Maybe you clean all the stuff like holistically and you keep all the stuff in place. Then you probably don't need to use like email verification services at all. Maybe if you are tempted to, to tackle on the part of your audience that haven't been really like engaged or converting over the year, but there's a chance, but you really have to be mindful and you really need to understand your audience, your customer base. They might be ask, actually waiting for your offer, like Black Friday offer. Then if you haven't been engaging with them, if you haven't been sending to them, it's let's say a sunset part, a segment of your list, then it might make sense to use the, the email verification services for that segment because you haven't been reaching out to them. And then it, it might make sense to verify the list from the perspective of deliverability of the email addresses, just to check maybe if there have been some maybe mistyped email addresses or the ones that got suspended or blocked or abandoned, or if you are in B2B, maybe people change jobs. So identifying non-deliverable email addresses is a, is an important aspect, but also it's, it is also interesting to, to verify like a toxicity of your list, like check if there are like riskier email addresses on your list. We for, I, I don't want like some email serve, email verification services offer like checks against the spam traps. I don't like actually to expose to everyone the list of the spam traps because actually the good spam traps are anyway invisible or not available in public public space. But looking at the toxicity factors of the email addresses that, that some email addresses are actually having a higher probability of being spam traps or privacy litigators or complainers it might be handy especially if or over some email addresses have been, for example, like breach have been a subject to the data breaches. So they get a lot of emails and they're busier or are available on the purchase lists. So they get a mm -hmm. ton of emails like spam, more or less spammy emails. So those inboxes are busier. So you need to really, with your offer, you need to grab the attention. You need to go an extra mile to, to get an attention. So getting, especially if you don't have all of the information, all of the data in your marketing program, in your marketing, suite, then running some checks, utilizing the email verification services might be helpful. And, but if you, for example, if you haven't been in the email space or you haven't been tackling your customers through email marketing, so you have been silent in this channel, then definitely you need to do an extra work right now to prepare yourself, especially if you are like tempted to, to start at Black up. Friday, you don't want to start at Black Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably want the strategy like right now, also put in place those aspects like on your roadmap for the marketing, like a program enhancements in the marketing program, you, you do want to place in your backlog things that Calf mentioned. But yeah, this period of time is a risky, but it's also a tempting period of time to start actually utilizing the, this channel. But you need sure. to do that really carefully and probably with the help of deliverability experts and marketing, marketing experts. So you touched on a couple of things there. Oh, uh, this is just a geeky question and it's my question. And if nobody wants to answer it, I understand. <laughs> but it has the damage from the Ashley Madison list, is that, has that filtered through? Has that everybody that was exposed in that has changed their email address now, or are people still using those addresses? You're asking for a friend, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just tired of getting all that spam. I just really don't want any more of that spam. But Ranik, you touched on a point that I think is, as I know as a consumer, 
I really love. I love it when a form verifies, validates and verifies my email address in real time. I think of it yeah. as a customer service, right? Because I'm filling out this form on my phone. I'm probably walking. I'm going to screw up my email address, right? Even though I've got the muscle memory that I could probably type it in my sleep, it just takes the phone being in a slightly different spot or whatever, and skip becomes, I don't know, something else. AJ, AJIP, right? If, if for a brand, if they've validated and verified my email address in real time, then they can say, this is, did you mistype it? And, and then you get into how their form should be error trapping and how they should be presenting that error back to me. But Raymond, we got a, a question in the chat. And I, I want to ask you, because it goes also into some of the things that Radek was talking about around maybe not toxicity, but what's the best way Flack wants to know what the best way to contact someone with a catch all domain is. Yeah. So there's two answers on that. If you want to contact the owner of the domain, you, you could do who is records perhaps if that's still valid. But uh, my question would be, why would you even want to know? So if I set up a catch all domain and I use email and more at mydomain.com to sign up for this, uh, session, then that's my choice, right? So if I decide to create for each and every thing, a separate email address, so be it. And the catch-all does not mean that there's not static boxes besides that. The catch-all is basically the rest of it. So it is really hard to basically put some weight on that. Some of them basically put the catch-all and from spam perspective, it's not really very handy to keep catch-alls alive because, well, you take everything in. So each and every address that they make up, you also receive. So it will be quite busy if you do that. But I would say uh, focus on the engagement that you have. And if you have a close loop with somebody who is living behind the catch-all, you're fine. It doesn't really matter. It comes back to the engagement. And to put one more comment on what Radek said, many people, when they collect the list data, they do the verification, which is already more than a lot of the people do. But be aware that this is not like something you do once, right? If you do an engagement on lists, if you do cleaning on lists, list management is basically what you should be doing daily. Check if the local ESP in France is still having the same name, or perhaps did they merge with another one? The industry and the internet world out there is not a static thing. It's a living creature. So email addresses change, company, companies merge, um, companies go bankrupt. And you should wonder what will happen with those addresses. Yes, I've been emailing to them for five, six years, but all of a sudden it's a spam trap. How can that be? And it's really a matter of the list is not only a grow. So like a one-way street and you add, and sometimes somebody unsubscribes, you need to do a lot of work on your end also to make that list that you think is very valuable for your company. If you want it to be valuable, maintain it. And I could probably add to that using Raymond's analogy. I'm not cause of stuck in my head, but here I live in the Buffalo, New York area of the United States. I like to say we have the best snow in the world because I've been outside digging in seven feet of snow up to my chest. But the reason why I mentioned this is what if I don't drive my car all winter? That's about four and a half to five, three and a half to five months, give and take. The wheels get squeaky, the bricks get funky. So every winter I will out of the blue, grab the two little girls, throw them in the back. And my wife is like, where are you going? I'm like, eh, we're just going to turn around the neighborhood. Why? So that the car can still quote unquote, remember how to do its thing, drive potholes, whatever, run the engine for a bit because it's like minus 15 degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit here in the Buffalo area, New York area. But flip that over to your list with Raymond's point about list management and hygiene. It sits still for a while. Things could happen. People go on vacation, knock on wood, people go to heaven. Not the best example, but these things happen. ISPs also age out mailboxes, depending on some, somewhere between 18 to 24 months here and there, mailbox disabled, that error code 
there's a reason why. So if I am on Raymond's side of the house and I see a list where 90% has that error or Yahoo, for example, that tells me that a brand doesn't care about their list quality. And then we all know what will happen next. So I just wanted to add that in to what Raymond said. I think that the piece that we don't touch on enough is the uh, brand reputation, the damage to the brand reputation. If I get an email from a brand that I know I haven't engaged with in a long time, I'm like, it's like getting a call from a friend you had an argument with 10 years ago and haven't spoken to you since. <laughs> okay, maybe they want to make up and that'd be cool. That'd be great. But the way to make up is, hey, it's Black Friday, buy this barbecue grill at 25% at off. It's Black Friday. I live in London. It's raining. I'm not going to barbecue. I can guarantee it's going to be raining, <laughs> right? I'm not going to barbecue. And also, you may, you do have the best snow. There's nothing like lake effect snow, and it's the top stuff. All those people that live in the mountains, they got nothing. <laughs> I want to talk about something else that if you chuck this topic into a room full of email marketers, you will get a wide variety of responses, most of them shouty. Let's talk about the promotions tab. A lot of email marketers think it's a black hole and then others think it's really great because it helps users manage their inbox and make sure that they are in the right context or frame of mind when they go to engage those emails. What, what are y'all's thoughts? Kath, why don't you kick us off on that one? Sorry, can you ask that question again? <laughs> I can. Just so everybody knows, Kath is, it wasn't that Kath wasn't paying attention. She's been having a, a little connection issue and can't always hear what we're talking about. I was talking about promotions tab, Kath. Love it or hate it? Oh, the promotions tab. Oh, I love yeah. them. Love them. Absolutely love them. Because I, I, maybe it's just the way that I am, but I get very focused. When I'm at work, I'm at work. And then at nighttime, if I'm sitting from the TV and I go, okay, now what's happening? Or maybe during lunch or something like that. Then I go over and I know that everything's there. And then... Again, even for the updates, I'm looking for my confirmation of having just posted something and go straight to the updates. It makes my life so much easier. And this is why I get so frustrated. We get, I get less questions now because I think people are understanding and realizing the value of the tab. Um, but it always used to be, how can I get my our emails into the main tab instead of into the promotions? I'm like... But the promotions is where they want to see it. That's where they're going to be looking. That's their mindset. If you give them your promotional content in their main inbox, they're going to bypass it because they're focused. They're answering a, a question by their mom or they're answering their boss or whatever the story is, delivering a, a deliverable a deadline. When they're in the, the, the promotions tab, that means that they're in the right mindset. And they want to be looking at them. So for me, I think it's brilliant. I think they work really well. And yeah, now Apple's bringing it in. Fantastic. Any, anybody want to take the opposite opinion? I can't imagine you do, but anybody want to jump in there? Say it's a black hole? I could jump in and I won't say it's a black hole because we all love it. One thing that I've noticed <laughs> over the years and it's easy to forget human nature we're human we forget things but you'll be surprised how many times or um, every now and then that folks don't know that's an optional feature offered by google's gmail product so i can toggle the feature on or off and then i will have tabs or i won't have tabs so when gmail detects based on x amount of algorithms detectors pretty flags whatever content that's where they will say oh we're going to push that mail into the promotions tab if like you folks said the tone is promotional nothing is perfect which is where i can see the the scream on the street that oh my goodness my mail goes to promotion stuff maybe it's not a black or white problem or not a problem but Take a look at the content. If you feel it's not promotional, try to figure out the way and contact Google on how to say, hey, can you please detect my content better? It is promotional, so on and so forth. 
but also I remember showing my mother-in-law this exact scenario. She got pretty disappointed a few years ago. And I said, can I see your Gmail setting? She said, why? I said, let me check. Come on, grandma. Cause you know, your wife is always right. And then I rolls over to her mom. So I said, see that checkbox? That's why it was on or off. I can't remember, but she was not happy because her flight confirmation or something went to the promotions tab. I said, it's a one-off mistake. These things happen. Nothing is perfect, but that's one thing I'd like to politely throw out there. That feature is not on default for every single Gmail user. It's split 50, 20, 50, 50, 40, 60. We don't know. Only Google knows. And not every but single that, Gmail user has, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, but that's a really good point. Because combining your point and cast point, if I've turned on the promotions tab and you've managed to figure out a way to get around the promotions tab, well, actually you've just gone against my wishes. It, we could call it tab spam if you want, or <laughs> folder spam, right? Because I opted in, I opted into your mail and I opted in to get your mail in the promotions tab and you've come up with some way to get around that. So you've actually not honored my my opt-in. We are uh, very quickly running out of time. And I always like to end on the same kind of question, Radic. I think we'll start um, with you. And the question is this, of all the great people listening today, what's the one tip that you want to leave them with to get them, going back to the, going back to the title, to get them ready for their holiday email campaigns? If you're planning to change any, behave your like mailing behavior for the holiday season for the high season then it's about time to test your deliverability look at your list hygiene practices and strategically plan for the send outs it's 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 the time is now okay. you still have 99 days before the the black friday okay thank you raymond uh, i would suggest to check the basics once more. So some people have like security consultants doing an audit on their environment, like once a year or once every two years. But if you're feeling that Black Friday is very important for you, just like before holidays, some people let check their car an extra time, do the same with your sending infrastructure, check if everything is in place, if the DKIM alignment is there, if your SPF is still functioning like it should, because on those busy days, it will hurt twice as much than just doing it now in advance. Fair enough. Fair enough. You may. Um, Raymond stole my idea, so I'm going to cry. <laughs> but to add to that, I think someone, one of us mentioned it a little while ago. What worked 10 years ago is not going to work today. We don't leave our car. We don't check our tires once in the life of a car. Every six months, once a year, every three months. So flip it over the holiday season question. Yes, the holiday season in the US and depending on when in the year around the world is a little different. Like Independence Day is off by a few days between US and Canada. But we shouldn't have to wait for the holiday season to come up. But it does have a little more sensitivity. So like Raymond said, take that time, check the bells and whistles. But also adding to DMARC. DMARC has a reverse engineered way of telling you everyone that uses a domain name to send mail. So you, there's times where a marketing team, depending on the company size, you don't know that they're sending totally different type of content that we on this uh, webinar are sending. So DMR could give you visibility into that, but don't be quick to check the can alignment and all that stuff like Raymond said, but when you implement it, do it properly. Cause implementing is one thing, but I could implement SPF and have 99 lookups, which would make things go down. There's a limit of 10. Right, so right. just, and if you're not sure, don't be shy to look for someone that ha that can help. All of us, we love what we do late nights and candles, but candle burning, it never hurts to check and be humble and just ask. Fix the problem if I get, yeah, just ask if it gets worse. Cause trust me, we've all on this call, I'm sure broken stuff before and we fixed it. So, yep. Or we ask, ask somebody to help us fix it. Kath? Yep. Yep. Bring us home. Um, yep. Okay. Definitely st uh, be strategic. So start putting everything in, in place now. Like I said, if you've got a millions on your list and you, you don't normally contact all of them and you have to bring a lot of them on board, 
to start ramping up, start planning, start working at what campaigns, what are giving them pre, because you have to ramp up, pre Good Friday, pre holiday season. And then don't forget, you have to ramp down as well after the, that holiday, the, the Christmas holiday season. The best thing to do without, I, I don't have time to do this, but I'm going to just mention Halo Sending Strategy. And I'm going to put a little link here, right there, which tells you what to do with the Halo Sending Strategy. That's going to give you the best deliverability. And so it means that all you're doing is you're saying, here, these guys are, are our regular senders and they tend to open and, and click and everything regularly. And then these guys don't. You back them up so that basically those that are unengaged benefit from the halo that the guys who are opening and clicking regularly will give to them. Okay. But read that article. Sounds like a topic for a whole session. Um, it's a whole to, session. Uh, there, there's to, enough. We'll have to add right I've got to say, everybody, this has been a brilliant conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I'm sad that we have to wrap it up. But my tip, I'm going to steal from Raymond, since Raymond stole from you. Don't be stupid. It's just something that Raymond said really early in the session. Righty ho. As I said, that's all we have had. We have time for today. Please let us know what you thought. Adding some comments in the chat. We'd love to hear your feedback. Please join me in giving a tremendous thank you to our panelists for providing their invaluable insights. It's been such a good session today. And of course, none of this would be possible without our sponsors. Another silver sponsor we have this year is Sino. Our friends at Sino have built an amazing email analytics platform that will enable you to explore and benchmark your cam email campaigns like never before. Their intuitive platform makes dealing with data feel like a friendly chat, not a complicated puzzle. And our friends at Bouncer, thank you, Radic. Bouncer is an email verification and deliverability platform with super powerful tech and a caring team behind it. Use Bouncer to increase your email marketing ROI and land smoothly in your recipient's inbox. Now, most of all, I want to thank you. I know your time is, is precious. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for spending uh, some time on this uh, lovely afternoon with us. Kath and I will be back on September 17th with another expert panel where we're going to do a deep dive into growing your email list. But until next time, be safe and make good choices. Thanks, everybody.